Yesterday, a short report came out about one of my top holdings claiming that it was the GE of Canada. Personally, I felt that this attack and this report was kind of silly. At times it was just mean and it overlooked certain key points. Now, I discussed this dynamic in a video that I posted yesterday uh, responding to what I thought were the key points of this uh, published report which is that, hey, if you're going to publish a report attacking a company, you should within the very first few pages say, hey, here's why I think, you know, this is going to collapse. I covered the beginning of the report. I covered the, let's say, the first half of the report. And, you know, I didn't really find anything. And that was the purpose of that video. Subsequently, I actually bought more Fairfax stock after I published that video. I like Fairfax. I've already called out how it's one of my top holdings. So in this video, I wanted to dive deeper to look at some of the additional comments because he saves this short report saves some of the biggest criticisms towards the end of the report. I personally think if you're going to have this huge claim that all oh, there's a fraud and I'm short it, you should put it at the beginning. But he saves some of the bigger ones for the end. And I think I know why. And so let's go through it now in this video in full disclosure. This is not financial advice, but looking at the report you know, the summary of it, really, he's talking about 20% and he goes through all these different items with this insurance company. And if this is your first time ever hearing about Fairfax Financial, this is an insurance company that no matter how you spin it, since its inception over a multi-decade period has absolutely trounced uh, the broader stock market indices. And management did an exceptional job during the great financial crisis. And they 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 I arguably were overconfident following the great financial crisis or they were overly concerned about the macro and they put on hedges that cost them significantly such that there was returns subsequent to the great financial crisis were very mediocre, not not super compelling. Management says, and I talked about this in my last video, management said, look, we're not going to pay place these very conservative hedges in the future, and we're going to run the business the way we previously did when we were crushing the market. And by the way, management has a lot of skin in the game. Prem Watsa has been running the company for decades. This is his life's work, owns 10%, around 10% of the company. So real stake in the company. This isn't like if, if the company were to get wiped out, it would probably hurt him more than any other single shareholder. So it's interesting to go through all these different transactions. This must have taken, I got to give, you know, Block or Muddy, I got to give them a lot of credit because this is, this requires a lot of work, a lot of analysis. I personally think it could have been better spent elsewhere. I think it was, you know, maybe he got an idea and just what started wanting to dig on something. And ultimately, I think it shows that you didn't really come up with much because what you're talking about here is adding all these pieces together. You're talking about something where you're saying, oh, I think maybe there's a 20% impact to the business, 20% impact to the book value. And so when I think about, okay, if you go line by line and try to provide a harsh critic, tries to provide an assessment and you're saying, yeah, there's a 20% impact at most, that's, as I'm going to talk about in just a second, largely conjecture, not no smoking gun. That's almost like getting a clean bill of health, in my opinion. If you have someone going like, it is my life's work to find, like go line by line. And I, once again, I applaud the level of detail in which he's looking at these individual things. But I think it's, it's sort of like the, the accountant that misses the bigger picture. And I think he's missing the bigger picture, which is that you have aligned management that have a history of treating shareholders well, a history of you know trying to treat their counterparties well, a history of significantly outperforming, being straightforward with the shareholders, and we'll talk about that in just a second. And you're focusing on these little accounting transactions. And if you're a big enough company, which they are, you're going to do a lot of transactions. And a lot of people, you know, I, as I call out in the previous video, they make mistakes. So you know, I, I everybody does. They have made mistakes in the past, but I don't think any of this was purposefully trying to manipulate shareholders or mislead shareholders. So I, I actually, and I think this is part of the reason why Fairfax is starting to respond, re rebound today is there's enough folks like myself that are saying like, wait a second, this is the best you could do in terms of Fairfax? Like that's it after months of work? That's, that's effectively like getting a clean bell of health for this company. So not surprised to see that Fairfax is actually 
rebounding uh, today. And why did he save the biggest, you know, the biggest claims for the end, which really comes down to two separate claims? Why? And it's because it's mostly conjecture. There are very few hard facts that actually make the short case here. So let's go into these two big claims, one of which is around Digit, an insurance company in India, where he claims that Digit, you know, that management was lying about Digit's profitability. Honestly, this seems like a stupid thing to call out. I mean, stupid is a harsh word. I, I, I don't like using words like that. It's, it just seems really like you don't at the time. I don't think he knew Digit's financials. He even calls it out. He's calling Digit Prospectus and the Fairfax financials. If you look at what they post online, I mean, it, it. I guess it depends on how you would interpret their results. It does look like they're profitable. So if management's saying they're profitable, I'm inclined to agree with them, especially because you're looking at a business that seems to be growing at a very good clip. Now, where I do give Muddy Waters credit is their point that since they there was outsider investor interest. Now, take a step back. What ended up happening was Fairfax helped incubate this insurance company in India called Digit. That's partly because of Prem Watts's background and relationships in India. And this this has been a home run for them. Like all in their cost basis is like $150 million. The company has been growing very quickly, could, could capture a lot of market share in India. And outside investors during the recent, you know, funny month, funny money, monkey pictures, you know, boom, said, hey, we want to buy some of this as well. You know, so people were were hyped up about a lot of stuff and they assigned a lofty valuation to Digit as well. And Fairfax rightfully said, OK, well, if there's this third party that's looking to buy in to this business that we help build, uh, yeah, we'll mark it up. That makes sense. It's totally logical. Subsequently, this is Carson Block's point. Uh, Muddy Water is saying, well, look, if you look at a bunch of insure tech companies, which arguably that that's what how Digit is billing themselves, the stock prices have fallen significantly since sort of this this hype phase has passed. Now, how come Fairfax hasn't subsequently marked it down? Well, I think it comes down to a couple of things is Fairfax marked it up because there was a transaction in Digit where someone was looking to buy it and they don't have to say, oh, OK, now, you know, just because Carson Block you know, says, oh, and sure tech stocks are down. We're we're going to change our valuation methodology from someone just wanted to pay this to let's do a comp based approach. It does. It doesn't make any sense, especially when the fact is that digit continues to do really well. It continues to grow at a very good clip. So I view this as something where you're focusing on. And if you go through the report, you're focusing on some very niche aspects, very, you know, past transactions that misses the bigger picture. And that, I, I just keep thinking like he thought he saw something. And if you were looking at someone that was shadier, I would think you might be, you know, maybe you were worth learning more. But when you have the skin in the game and you have the track record that you do here, this isn't intentional deceit. This is just, I think, confusing an accountant at 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 the end of it that you're that you're looking at here. And so and, and you know, full credit for for a clever and thoughtful forensic accountant. You know, full full credit to them. So their second large claim, he goes, it's suspiciously large that Fairfax had this accounting adjustment. So Fairfax in the past year had this huge accounting adjustment that was favorable for them. They make it very clear in the quarters leading up to it that they didn't want to do it. And that that's also not how they run their own business. The accounting adjustment really says, hey, any sort of future losses, you need a discount using some sort of discount rate. Uh, for the future. And they go, well, we don't really run our business that way. We look at the premiums that are coming in and the expected costs that are going out, and that's how we do it. But for the accounting basis, which all these insurance companies need to adjust to, they had to do it. And it resulted in a favorable charge for them. It's extremely complex to get your head around. And the way, you know, Block or Muddy frames it is, well, look at the relative changes that these other insurance companies did. Now, it's apples to oranges to compare, let's say, Fairfax to an auto insurance company. Uh, so I, I it's sort of weird to see some of these comparisons. Um, I think Admiral's an, an auto insurance company. I could be mistaken. Um, but looking at this, you know, it's it's the, the calculation is sort of saying the changes that these other insurance companies had 
was relatively smaller versus Fairfax. In one case, it was 4.4% versus 6%. I personally look this, and I think, you know, this was a term uh, a fellow banker shared with me as back during my banking days. He said, that's mice nuts. Uh, I, I view this as sort of like, it's purely conjecture that you think <laughs> Fairfax is overstating. And that's once again, why I didn't even call it out in my video yesterday is you saved the biggest criticisms for last because it's mostly mice nuts. It's mostly conjecture, uh, like in terms of like, oh, I, I, it's, I, it's very suspicious, very suspicious here. Now let's go into some reality here. Let's go back to reality, folks. So one of their holdings is in Eurobank, which they made during the Eurozone crisis, arguably at a, at a great, you know, great investment for them. This is an example of conservatism because the fair value is higher than what they're carrying at. So, you know, this goes against the whole theme of the report. And Eurobank subsequent to their Fairfax's most recent financials are up 30%. So this alone adds around $500 million to Fairfax's book value. So this would offset, you know, at least half of, you know, one of these big criticisms he has. And this is not even mentioned in the report. I think this is part of the reason, once again, why Fairfax is rallying today is people are going, wait a second, like this isn't that big. The the concluding summary, and this is the reason why I like Fairfax. One of, one of the key reasons why I bought more Fairfax is because management has in in their history, and you can go back, I have a copy of, you know, their last 25 years of financials over my shoulder, 25 years of letters. You can go through their history. And generally, if management says, hey, this is it, it is it. It's not like this is it and oh, it's not. And so when they say, hey, we think we can earn $3 billion annually for the next three years, that gives you a good framework. Now, Maybe they don't do it. There's no guarantees, as management calls out, but they do provide a framework to help understand how they could do it. The main reason why, and this is the part that a lot of people missed, is they for years were way more conservative than most, which is that when interest rates went to zero, while everyone else reached and invested in 30 year or 20 year bonds, they said, no, we don't want to take on that risk. We'll just accept earning less. That is extremely hard. Most people cannot do that. Most people do not have the discipline to do that. Once again, that discipline is not called out in this report. And that's why I think it's more of a hit piece where I suspect this this short seller has has been watching the stock tick higher and higher, spending weeks on this short report. I I don't see how this works out for him. I think it's going to be a mistake to have shorted. I once again, I'm I'm using Interactive Broker. See the link below to make sure my shares are or if anyone wants to borrow those shares and, and short it to push the stock price lower. I mean, I'm ultimately comfortable with it, partly because Fairfax is, you know, has a history of buying back stock. And you can see that also over the last few years. But getting back to one of the key reasons why I own this. And look, I'm not I'm not going to do a video every time they report earnings. I'm just sharing this just because not every day you get a short report on one of your top holdings and subscribers at Unrivaled Investing know, you know, I've owned Fairfax and it's around four hundred dollars per share. And so, you know, I, I I have a little bit of a history with the company in terms of following it. And so. You know, so th they know that I, I like this and I don't I don't regularly call out you know, what, what I'm doing, but subscribers here on, on YouTube often say, Daniel, I want to know more about what you're buying and selling, but I don't necessarily want to go, you know, pay for your subscription. So here it is. I'm sharing Fairfax a little bit more detail. I'm not going to share the earnings. I'm going to save that for my subscribers, but looking at, you know, what, what Prem Watson is saying, he's saying, look, we have a $1.5 billion from interest and dividend income. We have, you know, another $1.4 billion, you know, from underwriting profit. Then he's talking about half a billion from associates and non-insurance companies. The key point here that was completely missed in the report, it was completely like, hey, let's drive by just looking at the rear view mirror. What they did in the past is interest rates are now higher and Fairfax can arguably lock it in for the next three years, which they've done. And so for the next three years, unless their insurance operations suddenly turn dramatically worse. Possible. Doesn't seem likely, but possible. You're, you're talking about a high single digits to maybe even a 20% type of return on equity for the next couple of years. And so that just strikes me as surprising. And that's personally why I bought 
more is because it trades around one times book. So I, I continue to view the recent, you know, short report and sell off as a little bit of a gift for the investors that are willing to, you know, learn about a situation like this. Now you'll get some people saying, oh, I knew it was shady. That's why this short reports. So I'm not going to, but that's why I made these two videos is to like, actually let's, let's go through it. Like, let's understand what exactly are the criticisms? I encourage realistic advice and realistic, you know, feedback. Let's get real data points. If there are real data points that suggest I'm wrong on Fairfax, I would love to hear it. But so far, what I think we're seeing is just conjecture in theory and arguably a cynical and paranoid investor saying, ah, oh, I'm very large, suspiciously large charged. This is bad. Like, you, how, how come you're overlooking a $500 million gain since then? That's actual. That's real. So your suspicions outweigh a real gain that, that like we can show? Anywho, I hope this video has been helpful for you. If so, please make a point of hitting that thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button. Thanks so much for watching Unrivaled Investing.